I can utilize all the lovely things that Frank offers. Um, there's heaps of those. But when he sends me some doozy ideas, you know, some, some you know, uh, BS, so to speak, you know, unhelpfulness, uh, things that are certainly not beneficial, I can just go out and say, ah, oh, you know, Frank can, um, you know, talk a bit of crap sometimes. So, you know, thanks, mate. Cheers, mate. But um, I'm not going to follow that. Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Today's topic for the podcast is perfectionism and the imposter syndrome. I'm going to put forward today a concept or an idea around having a gentleman called Frank in your mind. I think you're going to really enjoy this in terms of how we go out and relate with perfectionistic thoughts, how you relate with imposter syndrome thoughts. So if you're interested in managing unrelenting standards, from an ACT perspective, that's acceptance and commitment therapy. Listen in. Hi, Mary. It's uh, good to have you back on the uh, podcast. Hi, Nesh. It's, uh, it's great to be back um, and chatting with you again. Um, so today I thought we could have a bit of a chat about perfectionism and maybe delve into um, a bit of imposter syndrome as well. So, um, so the two concepts kind of overlap a little bit and they're both something that uh, many of us have experienced in different contexts of our lives to some extent. Um, so should be very relevant for many of the listeners out there. Uh, so to start off, maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, what perfectionism actually is and how we can go about sort of uh, defining it. It's a really good question and it's certainly something that I see in my practice every day. From an ACT perspective, and, and this is quite, a, I think, a, an interesting way of looking, looking at perfectionism or, or in actual fact any strongly held thought, strongly held belief, strongly held you know, idea, when we think about perfectionism, it's thoughts and feelings that we go out and we hold tightly about something. So uh, this in, in, in the context of perfectionism or, you know, the imposter syndrome, it's thoughts that are held in line with that. So ACT would in some sense go out and argue that the idea of experiencing perfectionism is holding perfectionism in a certain way. So if someone holds perfectionism tightly, you know, they, they grip it. It means they, in some sense, lead their life in line with however strict that perfectionistic rule is. Um, I personally do this a lot. You know, I have some very high standards and I try and meet them. I try and achieve them, you know, impeccably. And the question around, you know, perfectionism and, and this, this idea of imposter syndrome is the cost of holding those thoughts, all those ideas really, really tightly and how rigid those ideas and thoughts and rules are. So when we kind of try and explore what is imposter syndrome or what is perfectionism, in some sense I would go out and describe it as strongly held or tightly held ideals, tightly held standards, tightly held, uh, you know, unrelenting rules around how things should be or how I should meet those things and the measures might be time frames or quality or uh, any. In actual fact, it doesn't even matter what the measure is. It's just a very strict measure. Um, and so once we hold ourselves to that, it can be very, very stressful to try and achieve that ongoingly. Um, and where the imposter syndrome comes from is we try to continue to maintain an incredible level of standard and we're in great fear that eventually someone's going to realise and find out that we are not who uh, people think we are or what they've seen from us that we're going to fail and that's going to expose us and when we're exposed we will effectively be rejected, disregarded, thrown out of the group, the club, whatever it might be, and we'll be alone and rejected. And, you know, that's the most awful thing that can happen. 
So there's this kind of perpetuating fear around being able to maintain a standard that we hold really, really tightly and whether we can actually achieve that or not. And uh, inevitably, we can't. Or interestingly, even if we can, the stress that's caused or experienced to try and maintain that is phenomenal and it just starts to ruin our lives. Yeah, and um, I like that you touched on um, the relationship between feelings and thoughts and perfectionism rather than, you know, some external kind of metric of, of measuring it because I think a lot of the times when people are experiencing um, perfectionism, it comes from a, a feeling of wanting to be perfect and wanting to feel as though they're perfect and wanting others to perceive them as perfect uh, rather than, you know, and, and a, cons- a, a part of that might be actually achieving that perfect standard but a bigger part I think is feeling as though we're perfect and being perceived um, that way Uh, and I think you know with imposter syndrome there is that kind of social element of that as well of considering what are other people sort of thinking about me am I going to be caught out I'm not as great as everyone thinks I am Um, so I thought maybe we could kind of delve into that a little bit and um, talk a bit about the the social context of perfectionism um, as opposed to sort of you know, self-oriented perfectionism and if there's sort of a difference between the two and, and how that kind of plays out. Well, it's kind of interesting. I had a client this morning talk to me about how strained or constrained they are with time. And you know, this is a high achiever that, that ticks every box in the world, very impressive individual, achieved lots. You know, by all standards, most of us would go out and say they're a successful human being. But when we look at sort of these layers underneath, the angst caused by the responsibilities that this person puts on themselves are absolutely immense, you know, and, it, and it's a classic example. And I'm sure no one else thinks this way, but... Uh, this person has tried to get a cleaner in to uh, clean their house uh, so they can go out and use that time in other other places. But obviously when you're uh, such a high achiever and you hold perfectionism and the, 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 this fear of being caught out, found out, you know, people knowing about who I really truly am and what that's going to mean, they inevitably go out and clean the house for the cleaner to arrive right? mm-hmm. and i know that no one's done this before there are no listeners that have gone out and uh, done any of those sorts of sorts of things but it's quite an interesting pattern that we see and and talking with my client today and looking at different aspects of how they do life there are so many areas that this unrelenting standard uh, and in, in actual fact you know these rules about how life should be held, how life should be done is really becoming completely debilitating. Uh, But on all accounts, everyone else would go out and say, wow, you're doing such a great, great job. Uh, But there's this fear about this social um, experience of being found out. Uh, And in, 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 in many cases, you know, this person's mind is closed down, shut down, completely fused with being able to entertain any other idea. So it's no different to when someone goes out and they have a perfectionistic or or, uh, let's call it a social belief that if they're running late for an appointment that they are being disrespectful. And so it's very highly stressful for the person to go out and be late ever so they're anxiously always on time and it causes immense grief you know it's it's trying to be perfect or sometimes it might even be you know finding the perfect or the right thing someone might be trying to organize let's say uh, an event and they're trying to find you know the perfect color of balloons and so the angst of finding the right color will it actually go out and be there and what that means about me this is an unrelenting standard it's not only a standard of you know ourselves It's also a standard of what we end up achieving, whether we achieve this ideal uh, and obviously the the fear of the imposter that I'll be found out. Obviously, the imposter uh, 
sort of space comes comes more so in things like career or achievements, performance that, you know, I've been achieving up until now, but it's all been a fraud, you know, that, that I'll be found out soon. But there's, there's certainly a huge social construct there but even interestingly in the social construct there, there's still the measure that personal measure that we place on ourselves and that's why i like the term you know unrelenting standards that no matter how hard the we work at actually achieving the standard it becomes unrelenting so the standard moves and it's it's not it's no different to an athlete who gets their personal best and so all of a sudden I know they've jumped the highest or they've you know done the most ama- amount of you know backhand you know um, cross court winners during their tennis match and now they're trying to beat that last figure and unless they beat that last figure they're not doing good enough they're going to be found out and they keep trying to beat their PB so the measure becomes against a personal best, an unrelenting standard, rather than something that's more functional. And that socially plays out you know, in how they go out and, and, and um, you know, do life. But it is interesting because perfectionism doesn't often, uh, my apologies, uh, I don't often see with my clients who are highly perfectionistic having an unrelenting standard for others. Some do. Um, but mostly we see an unrelenting standard for oneself and not for another person. And so it's quite funny to kind of see the contradiction there uh, and, you know, see how people wrestle with this, you know, and you'll, you'll hear things like, you know, I know this doesn't make sense or it doesn't apply to others, but, and it's that but that goes out and kind of disregards uh, what they've just said. So it's, it, it's quite complex in that social setting because it's all about you know the ego the i i being found out or i having to do something exceptionally well versus others Mm. and i think there's also a bit of a a black and white kind of thinking in perfectionism as well where it's um you know if i don't achieve this standard then i'm a failure rather than hey i'm doing okay and maybe there's one or two things that aren't going to be amazing but that's okay um so i'm wondering what what are some of the the causes i guess um or some of the predeterminants to people um exhibiting this these kinds of thinking around perfectionism and an imposter syndrome but the first thing that pops to mind for me is in actual fact somewhat of a personality trait that we look at in terms of conscientiousness, we know that's part of the big five. You know, there's openness, there's conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And that, it, I think it's that conscientiousness space that really um, is, a, is, is a large factor in, in this as well. But I would also go out and, and talk a little bit about our environment. You know, I, I think our environment goes out and reinforces right and wrong. You know, this black and white thinking that you were talking about is, is in actual fact spot on. This right-wrong determination, you know, that we see in school, we know that it's right to get an A grade and we know it's wrong to get an F grade. We actually call it an F for fail. Um, well, at least that's how kids go out and, and, and uh, hear it. So we, we're told that that is not right and the higher you go up, Know, if it's a C, it's okay. If it's a B, it's better. An A is excellent. You know, an A plus is even better again. And we might, we'll, we'll even give certificates and all that other stuff to go out and acknowledge that. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't acknowledge it, but we see that all of these things become reinforcers. And so I think there's, there's certainly a biological or genetic or, you know, personality predisposition. And then there's also our environment and our environment continues to ask people to excel, you know, to do the right thing. And, you know, let's think about it. To be perfect or, you know, to uh, have an unrelenting standard means that you tend to work harder at something and we continually reinforce um, greater effort. Um, and, and, I mean, I know... I've done it, well, I do it with, with, with myself all the time. I do it with my kids. I do it with, 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 with lots of things. And the question is just a bit around functionality rather than anything else, which is, you know, that, that primary thought within the ACT model 
about how functional is something and, and functional often talks about how flexible it is. Ooh. And perfectionism, the problem with perfectionism is it's not flexible. Ooh. You know, it's different to say I want to be perfectly flexible. You know, so I'm striving for, you know, more and more flexibility. Uh, but, you know, having flexibility in there helps and it assists a little bit versus I just want to be perfect. And, mm. and there's only one measure of what that is. And so perfectly flexible, um, I don't think that's a great term, but if I continue to use, with, use that, uh, it at least gives us more uh, options of what that might look like so that we're less likely to, to get stressed if option A isn't met, option B might be met or C or D or whatever it might be. So one of my favorite things when I think about flexibility and whether it be perfectionism or, you know, the imposter sort of space is the practice of patience. So if we can go out and practice patience, sitting with discomfort or sitting with not being perfect, that, you know, maybe I'm trying to build a better repertoire of how I can be patient or how I can be accommodating or how I can be understanding of something other than, you know, perfect, something other than an unrelenting standard, Uh, you know, trying, even being trying to be perfectly patient is a problem, right? Because it'll measure patience in a perfect way and it becomes a problem. Um, So I think, you know, there, there are these nuances in, in this and it makes it a really hard space to try and fully appreciate about what we can go out and do. I'm not sure what the, uh, what the question was. I've just lost it because I lost <laughs> the train of thought, um, but I hope I answered some of that. Definitely. Um, and I think you, you covered a bit there. Um, and I, I suppose what I took from that is... Um, I guess challenging that that sort of that black and white kind of thinking and allowing ourselves the space to be a little bit um, more flexible with the way, with the standards that we set for ourselves and with the way we go out and approach, um, you know, different domains of our lives. Um, You did touch on kind of, you know, this culture of um, hard work and, you know, this almost praise for being highly conscientious. And um, as you were kind of talking about that, I was thinking about, um, job interviews and often when uh, an employer will ask the you know the candidate what their biggest weakness is they'll often say oh I'm such a perfectionist and you know that's my biggest weakness and it's almost like the weakness that everyone loves to have because you know it's 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 kind of showing that you're this really hard-working person and it's kind of this you know oh okay well you know you you know you work so hard and that's that's your biggest downfall um whereas it actually can be a downfall um and it's i suppose so highly praised in today's society um that we sort of don't uh, often recognize the consequences of having this rigid kind of thinking around us being so perfect um and so I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit on um, what what are the consequences, I suppose, of having these um, these standards. These yeah. You know. Well, the consequence for the let let's think it's a law firm, right? As an example, right? the consequence for the law firm for someone who's perfectionistic is that the law firm gains more and more billable hours. So in actual fact, it's fantastic, right? We've got someone who's highly driven, who's going to go out and work themselves to, to the bone. They're going to go out and tick all the boxes. They're going to have very happy clients. They're going to go out and tick all the, you know, uh, T's, dot the I's so that whether it's contracts or whether it's process is, is, is followed, they'll be an exceptional lawyer, right? And we will go out and often reward them, they'll get acknowledged because of the volume of hours or the billable hours that they, they do. So commercially, it ticks all the boxes. And our society goes out and holds you know, commercialism so high. And so it's very reinforcing. And all of a sudden, someone goes from, you know, a junior 
um, to maybe, and my apologies because I don't know the ranking system, but, you mm. know, might be an associate or something or other to a senior lawyer to maybe a partner or something like that. And, and, and so there's, there's this kind of progression and it feels great to go and get them as, as you go. So the company goes out and certainly gains immensely. And that's nothing bad about companies. They're, I mean, uh, that, that's how this world, you know, operates and works and, and that's wonderful. The only question when we start looking at what's the cost or where, where the problem is, is it can at times be highly stressful, uncomfortable, painful, difficult for the person themselves. So even though they're going out and ticking all the boxes and they're getting promotions, everyone around that person says, wow, you know, you're such an impressive human being and so on and so forth. Yet the cost on them personally, you know, that the fact that they wake up in the morning and the first thing that happens when they open up their eyes, you know, might be about, oh my God, I have to go out and see X amount of, you know, clients throughout the day. I've got to go and make sure that I write an email back to everyone that's in my inbox. I've got to go to these meetings that I didn't schedule for. I've been asked to go do something that's really important uh, for one of my senior staff, uh, sorry, senior managers, et cetera, et cetera. And, and if I don't do all of that, it's not a productive day. You know, if I miss any of those items, if I stuff up one email, if, it, if, if I CC the wrong person, if I put, don't, don't document something properly or I don't put in some notes, if I you know, miss some uh, paperwork that should have been met or I forget to tell someone something plus all the other 15 things I've got to do in my personal life that needs to be done between, you know, within my lunch hour, et cetera, et cetera. You can hear the rapid thoughts of the space. That's sort of like the first three minutes of someone waking up, right? That's not necessarily going to be, you know, wonderful and great. And if someone's perfectionistic in the rest of, you know, their life, they're also trying to have a perfect diet and then trying to get out of the, out of their house perfectly on time and, uh, you know, be presented immaculately potentially, then do that whole whole day. You know, it's the intensity. It's a great, great, great intensity. And, you know, someone goes out and, and invites them to something social of evening and they, they feel they need to go out and achieve that as well because that's what a perfect friend does. Yeah. These are unrelenting standards. And, you know, around comes 9 o'clock and they, you know, 9 p.m. that is, and, and the person's exhausted. Um, but they're reinforced. They're re- reinforced as a wonderful friend. They're reinforced as a great, you know, worker. Uh, clients have gone out and thanked them. And so it's very hard to see your way out, although you're living in immense stress. Now, I'm not suggesting you by any means that the cost is always that if someone is a type A personality, they're a go, go, go bunny. They love doing that sort of stuff. But there is a cost to it for some who might, might not have that personality or might not enjoy it anymore. Maybe it was kind of enjoyable and adaptive to begin with. It's yeah. just not continuing to, to, to serve them. And so we see people talk about burnout or I'm exhausted. And burnout is not necessarily always about uh, uh, it's too hard at work. It's, it, it's often an overcommitment. You know, overly responsible for so many things and the unrelenting standard that one places on themselves. And once again, it means someone's put forward a really rigid idea or a goal about what they're supposed to achieve on a daily basis or you know, by a certain time frame or what they, where they believe they would be and they just fight for it day in, day out and they forget, they, they disregard, I suppose, other areas of their, their life. So the cost is not usually... You know, on others, uh, uh, you know, on an organisation, for example, but it certainly can be on the person. And, you know, the person, by all rights, on the outside looks amazing. As a matter of fact, we aspire to that person. You know, we're, we, 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 you know we're, we're, we're in awe of how they go out and do it. And look, some, some do it and they tick all the boxes and they love it and it's not about perfectionism. And in actual fact, I've got a great whole handle on this. So perfectionism and, and this imposter stuff is stuff that happens on the inside. 
You know, no one can see this necessarily. And you know, so we don't know is, is an impressive person on the outside struggling uh, or are they actually, in actual fact, you know, very content and happy and, and, and driven by that achievement. Um, but the cost certainly can be immense, immense, you know, and, and, and it's a personal cost, not usually, you know, a cost to others. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And I think um, on that, we'll often sort of throw the term out of perfectionism for people who are highly driven, um, highly ambitious. A lot of the times, um, you know, with with celebrities who are practicing hours and hours a day to perfect their their singing or dancing or acting routine or whatever it may be, um, it might be that, that they have traits of perfectionism. But it also might be that they just really, really like what they do and it's actually not having this really negative impact on the way that they're viewing themselves, the thought processes that they're engaging in, the feelings that they're having. They're just actually really um, enjoying it. Uh, Whereas I think with perfectionism, kind of uh, a bit of the difference there is there's this, like you said, that unrelenting standard, this black and white kind of thinking, this concern, you know, overwhelming concern about making mistakes and the way we're going to be perceived if we do slip up and um you know often I think we can almost end up sort of procrastinating doing things as well and it's sort of almost like this vicious cycle where we're we're almost paralyzed because we need to achieve this standard and um if we don't it's just the end of the world so we almost become frozen and um it can actually, you know, like I said, perpetuate that cycle of, oh, God, now I'm a failure because I didn't get this done or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, And I suppose the other thing that came to mind was um, opportunity costs. So, you know, like you said, if we're putting in, you know, going along with the the workplace example, if we're putting in hours and hours and hours each and every day um, and we're leaving feeling stressed and burnt out, we might be missing out on opportunities to pursue our hobbies, um, spend time with loved ones, um, you know, even just relax, just sit down and watch TV and, and chill out because we're so invested in, in achieving the standard and so preoccupied um, in our minds with, you know, with achieving it. And this word of, you know, being perfect is often, you know, synonymous with, with right trying to find the right thing or the the right decision being as you say uh somewhat frozen you know in unable to make a decision i'm trying to find the perfect gift mm. it's so difficult to find the perfect gift and someone could just walk around the shops forever and ever and ever trying to find the the thing you know and these things become problematic because when you know if we think, think about it from an obsessive compulsive perspective someone who's trying to for example align you know put a glass down on a, on a table and they're trying to put it down perfectly um and it might be that they're trying to find symmetry you know so uh, it, it needs to be a certain distance from the edge of the table there's a perfection trait going on there where i'm trying to feel uh, that this glass is in a particular area where my feelings feel right about it. It's the, it's the right feeling and that, you know, means that nothing bad is going to happen. But until that goes on and until that happens, I have to keep adjusting the glass. Okay. So it, it can be debilitating. It, it can go out and, you know, freeze people, people up where they find it difficult to function. So it's not just the trait that goes out and, goes with high functioning um you know it can also uh stop us from doing tasks you know i know for myself writing is not my forte by any means and 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 i know it's very hard for me to put words down on on paper unless i feel in my mind uh, and in my body that they are the right words, you know. So people talk about you know just put your ideas down on paper and then go back and edit it and there's this real wrestling match that, that, that says, no, no, I've, I've got to go out and it's got to come out perfectly. And that can be debilitating. There's lots of students who can't start an assignment or, or you know, a piece of work until it's perfect or, or they can start it and they can get it to a certain level, but they won't hand it in unless it's perfect. And I've, I've seen so many students who have completely written up a, 
a um, you know, piece to an assessment piece to, to hand in, but it's not there and they don't hand it in. Mm. And it's kind of crazy because the person's got it available. If they hand it in, they'd get a good result, but they just can't do it because it's not, it's not perfect. Or, you know, they, they can't write it, but they sit at the computer for hours without being able to do it because they're, they're, they're searching for that unrelenting standard. In some sense, we've all probably got it in some area. The question is just, once again, from that ACT perspective, where's the functionality? Most athletes are perfectionistic in, in, in their traits. You kind of need to, to, to do so if you're trying to master a skill set. So anyone that masters anything, it doesn't even need to be an athlete. When I talk about athlete, I'm not talking about a professional athlete, someone who's passionate about a, a sport, you know. It could be a guitarist, someone who, you know, is is yearning and, and motivated to try and improve, you know, how they strum the guitar or how they do certain chords or whatever that might might be. My apologies, I don't know much about you know, but that I'm using that analogy, you know, there, there's a lot of in, intricacies. The question is just whether someone's stressed about it and gets frustrated and annoyed. And I know when I've tried to play instruments before, I try and do it too well too fast. You know, maybe because I can swing a racket or I can kick a ball or whatever it might be, I, I can do that quite fast and, and I can get achievement through through that. And when I start doing music, you know, something a bit more creative, it's hard and, and I get frustrated and that's where it becomes debilitating. I'm not willing to practice enough, right? So in one area, I can do lots of it. In another area, you know, it, it, it certainly gets in the way. Mm. So what I'm hearing is it has in- incredible tolls on our mental well-being, our opportunities, our behaviours, and um, you know I think it's important to acknowledge that although perfectionism in itself isn't a diagnosis, um, it's a part of you know like you said that obsessive kind of tendencies, anxiety, um, you know, depression, even eating disorders, holding ourselves to that you know perfect standard of, of how we should look and how we should you know, hold ourselves and, and be in the world. Um, so I'm wondering if maybe we could delve into um, what we can actually do about our perfectionism if it is something that we experience. Where, where do we start and, and how do we address it either by ourselves or with a therapist? Yeah, I think it's really important to consider that, that place around functionality, you know, is, is this serving me or not? And, and, that's a hard, hard thing to tease apart, you know. And I think having some professional assistance uh, to be able to talk with someone around where is the, that functional line and, and how does that functional line change in different contexts or change over time to understand, you know, is this standard or the way that I hold this standard uh, helpful or not and how might I hold that standard different in different contexts? Because in one context, having a high standard can serve you immensely, and in another context, it um, you know it 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 will be defeating. It'll go against you. And classic example is in the things that you can control. Often, being reasonably flexible in controlling those, but putting in a lot of control measures will serve you. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of things that 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 you know, are, re- are rewarded for if you go out and do them of a high standard. Then there are times where, uh, depending on the context, for example, when things are out of your control, by holding these standards tightly, it's just going to cause angst, frustration, and so on. So if someone is holding other people to a high standard, an unrelenting high standard. They might come across as being um, obnoxious or rude or whatever it might be because they can't appreciate other people, um, you know, for who they are because all they see is their deficiencies, you know, that they're not meeting a particular standard. You know, it's this kind of a whole black and white thinking of everyone should do things in a particular way. So I think... 
that that first step of being able to distinguish, being able to see, notice, recognize, be aware of whether something is serving you or not. And that doesn't mean that it all just goes away by any means by, by, by just noticing it, but at least you're kind of going out and having a bit more of a sophisticated look at it, it's a different perspective. I think it's important to be able to notice our perfectionistic thoughts, you know, our imposter thoughts, you know, our unrelenting standard thoughts, rigid thoughts. I think by noticing, and this, this is that diffusion space in acceptance and commitment therapy, by noticing thoughts and recognizing that these are kind of these arbitrary ideas, rules, um, thoughts, comments, judgments, measures that are just popping up by being able to see that they just are without necessarily having to you know, engage with them, trying to put a little bit of distance between yourself and, and the thoughts can be very, very helpful. I often talk about it of, of having a voice in your head. Um, and I don't know whether I got this from Steve Hayes or, or, or read it somewhere else or whatever, wherever it might be, but the voice to me is a gentleman called Frank. And so Frank is always, you know, talking, you know, the, the cartoons where you got the devil on one side, you got the <clears throat> angel on the other. Well, the devil for me is, is Frank, right? But in actual fact, I think there's one voice and that one voice is both the devil and the angel. Right? And it talks through Frank, right? And, and I, I, I give the voice a persona to give some distance between you know, me and it. And we know this psychology tells us that we have automated thoughts, right? We, we, we might call it a stream of thoughts in act. We might call it uh, automatic negative uh, thoughts in CBT. Uh, we might go out and think about it, you know, from, from a perspective of schemas, um, you know, obviously in, in, in the schema work or the modes. So we, there's different languages that we use, obviously, in psychology, but they're all effectively saying the same thing. There's a voice, right? Or there's these rules. We've got to ask, you know, is it serving me or not? Is this rigid or, or, or not? You know, then by just virtue of being able to see it, you know, to, to notice it, to put some distance between me and it, it means I don't have to necessarily follow it. Because right? if I follow everything that the mind, you know, says to me, that's the, that, that's the time that I have to go out and start cleaning the house before the cleaner comes to clean the house because there's a thought going on um, that, that, that's urging me to do it. Now, Frank is a little bit more clever than that. Frank doesn't just give thoughts. He also goes out and puts sensations in my body. So this is where I can feel the urges, the feelings, the angst, the, you know, whether we call it anxiety or Describe it a little bit better by saying pressure on our chest, uh, movement in our stomach, hot or cold flushes, sweatiness, nausea, tightness in my throat, tightness in muscles, you know, headache, etc. So Frank produces these other automatic things. You know, this is our limbic system response. So Frank's going out and telling me these these rigid, unrelenting thoughts, and he's also making uncomfortable sensations show up in my body. And so the urge is if I don't clean the house, I'm going to feel worse and I'm going to be burdened by Frank. So it's best that I just clean the house before the cleaner comes so that Frank shuts up and I feel relief of that discomfort. What we're effectively looking at doing is perfectionism is just that it, it, it's following these thoughts and these feelings we, without any consideration you know it's we, we become frank's puppet and i want to go out and uh, you know cut those strings off and so i want to go out and you know be be myself rather than be pushed around and so by being able to see frank to see what he's saying to me to go out and recognize that he's making my heart race and I'm feeling uncomfortable and still not necessarily follow him. But that's a, that's a practice that needs to be cultivated. So flexibility, you know, the, uh, if, if we think about perfectionism as being rigid, obviously the opposite is about flexibility, you know, uh, values-based type of approach where I'm, I'm trying to go out and, and 
utilize uh, values or what's important, who and what's important to guide how I act. And so if I can go out and, and spend a little bit of time in practicing or cultivating, being able to see Frank and sit with this discomfort, uh, even though he's screaming at me perfectionistic things and telling me that I'm going to be found out, that I'm going to be an imposter, that you know, I will therefore be rejected. So the threat is high, but I've got to go out and kind of you know, challenge that or practice that a little bit. And I think we can do that a little bit at a time. I would never ask a client to do that, you know, uh, um, you know, in a, in a large or highly difficult scenario first. I might choose something that's a little bit easier to 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 um, deal with. Yeah, I suppose one of the challenges, um, and you know, I think this applies to perfectionism, but also to um, many other uh, mental health concerns, is even identifying that there is a Frank, um, because a lot of the times our our thoughts we we perceive them to be external, so we don't think, oh. Frank's telling me I'm going to lose my job if I don't, you know, sit here. It's like I'm actually going to lose my job if I don't meet these standards. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how we even kind of get to the point where we're able to to identify yeah. Frank. <laughs> Great question. Brilliant question. Uh, it's actually the old adage of, of close your eyes, think of nothing. Hard. Can you do that? Can you do that? Is, is, is difficult. that possible? Mm, that's yeah, is, very difficult. Is is it difficult? Does that mean that you can do it, but it's difficult, or is is it potentially impossible? What what what, what do you think? Um, for me, I'd, I'd say it's at this point it's virtually impossible. I don't know if um you know very experienced meditators have anything different to say, but um for me, yeah, I, I don't think I could do it. No. Yeah. In actual fact, what's, what's fascinating is people think that meditators can actually make their mind go blank. Uh, it, it's simply not the case. Mm. We can't stop Frank from speaking. Mm. Right? But there's this idea that I can, if, I, if I'm only diligent in, in you know, meditation or mindfulness, or if I practice something, I can go out and I can stop Frank from speaking. No one can stop, stop a stream of thoughts. No one can stop Frank from speaking, from talking. He, he, he narrates, he judges, he places measures, he criticises, he comments, he assumes. He's just constantly talking and chatting. We all know this because wouldn't anyone who's having sleep difficulties just shut Frank up? Right, but we hear this all the time. I can't stop thinking, and I go to bed, <clears throat> and I'm feeling frustrated. This is the mind, and and you know, Frank going, and he likes to do so sometimes when it's quiet. As a matter of fact, when we're not busy, he starts to talk even louder. Right now, he's he's actually there, at, you know, at all times, but sometimes we just don't notice him. So the easiest way to identify Frank is, you know, sit down. Be quiet, think of nothing. And you'll find that, sure, you might actually think you can do that for five seconds, 10 seconds. It's even interesting because even when you think you can do it, Frank is saying, yeah, I think I'm doing it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? I'm thinking of nothing. <laughs> yeah, I am thinking of nothing. Yeah, yeah okay, nothing, it's absent, it's blank. <laughs> mm, and yeah. eventually he goes, yeah, how long has it been? How long am I doing this? So you can't actually do it. So we need to fundamentally, you know, and this this acceptance sort of sort of uh, fundamentally know that Frank exists. And I don't think too many people appreciate that. I'd love to take this concept into uh, into schools and talk with kids to say, "Hey, everyone, Frank's alive, right?" You know. This is what's going on. We all have a Frank. And he's coming in all sorts of forms. Everyone's got a different Frank. For some, they have to go out and pluck their eyebrows because Frank is saying, 
remove any little deviation. Oh, I've got to have these perfect eyebrows. And no matter how hard we try, Frank keeps saying it's a little bit off. And then we all of a sudden we see people plucking all of their eyebrows down so they've got these really, really, really thin, you know, pieces of fur above their eyes. And eventually they rip those ones out as well and they start drawing them on. And Frank's still not happy. And he keeps saying, you draw it further, draw it darker, draw it thinner, draw it something. And sometimes it looks a little bit odd, right? Now, I don't really care how anyone uses their, you know, how anyone has, has their eyebrows presented, but it's just another version of Frank. So I think we've, we've got to notice that that's what Frank does. And interestingly, uh, once again, if we think about it, that's from a thought perspective. If we think about it from a sensation, a feeling perspective, if I were to say to you, stop yourself, you know, sit quietly, you know, and stop yourself from having any itch arise on your body. Don't have any itches. Don't. Don't feel like you need to scratch anything. You start don't, um, thinking about all the itches that you have <laughs> when you try not to. Right. And, and once again, human beings have a stream of sensations. Right? Now, often we're not completely, you know, aware of that, but if you actually sit still, you'll notice it. One of the first things that happens when you sit still is you have an urge a sensation to move a part of your body, mm-hmm. right? Whether it's because you want to scratch because it's itchy or it could be, hey, you know, my buttocks pressing down in this way is making it feel a bit more uncomfortable so I'm going to shift my weight to my other buttocks, right? And so you watch people sitting and they're constantly doing what? Are they Fidgeting. Doing- fidgeting, right? They're constantly adjusting themselves to feel more and more comfortable. That's Frank, right? So you, by by sitting there and noticing Frank, uh, you're able to go out and, you know, get a handle on this. And that's in actual fact what meditation asks us to do. It says, sit here on this cushion, close your eyes, Cross your legs, put your hands together, you know, very gently rest the tips of your thumbs together, have your back straight, okay, looking somewhat forward and concentrate on your breath right? because that's an automatic thing that's occurring. It's coming in, you know, your stomach's kind of coming out and you watch it to the tip of your abdomen and you watch the breath kind of coming all the way back up until you can feel the heat um, or the sensation of heat on your nostrils and then you watch the breath coming back in so it'll be cold on your nostrils going to you know back of your throat down your esophagus you know uh, or you know your lungs and out, out into your stomach as well and you're just observing and watching this process but in the meantime, Frank's saying, this is boring. How long has this been going for? I can't do this properly. I should be able to concentrate more. Why are others able to do it and I'm not? I must be crap at this. I'm weak. Maybe I should open up my eyes and see how everyone else is going. Uh, you know, I need to move. My back hurts. My knee hurts. I'm feeling uncomfortable. Why is my breath changing? I can't catch my breath properly. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, right? This is Frank. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So meditation is the practice of single-minded focus. Right? So every time Frank makes comment and takes our attention away from our breath, our job is to say, thanks, Frank, and without judgment, gently bring our attention back to the breath. Mm-hmm. And then 12, 15 seconds later, Frank's telling us another narrative that we're not very good at what we're doing and we say, ah, thanks, Frank, and we bring our attention back. And then Frank goes out and brings our attention to how our legs hurt because we, we're in a cross, cross-legged position and we don't usually sit like that as adults. And, and he's saying, well, I need to move, I need to move. And rather than moving, I say, thanks, Frank, or I might say, thanks, knee for reminding me, and I gently bring my attention back to my breath. 
<clears throat> so a lot of this mindfulness practice or single-minded focus is to be able to get in contact with Frank. It doesn't mean I'm at peace later on in the day or I feel like I'm floating after my meditation practice. Meditation sucks, right? It's awful. It's horrible. This is why most people don't do it because it's a really uncomfortable, unpleasant practice. Boring. People don't do it. It's boring as hell, right? It's me and Frank. And I'm supposed to focus on my breathing, you know, watching my breathing without any sort of um, uh, judgment on Frank and I keep finding myself judging Frank. And Frank's very good at entangling me. He tells me I'm no good and then he tells me how I'm not good at anything else and how I'm completely wasting my time and I shouldn't really be doing this and I'm never really going to follow through with meditation for any more than three weeks anyway. So what's the point? Why don't I just quit? All of a sudden, three minutes down the track, I haven't realized that I've been off my breath for three minutes and I, and and then what happens is Frank wants to keep judging, go, you idiot, rather than go there and say, I'm weak, I'm an idiot. I'm I say, thanks, Frank. I bring my attention back. Mm. So that's how we, uh, you know, if you think about that analogy, this is about being able to identify and see it. So that question of, you know, think of nothing, that's how we identify Frank. Yeah. I suppose um, some people might say, why do I have to accept Frank? Why can't I argue back with him and try to rationalize with yeah. him and change Frank's voice and get him to tell me nicer things about myself? Uh, why do I have to just accept what he's telling me and just deal with it? Well, ACT says you don't have to accept him. You can just keep fighting with him if you like. You can argue with Frank all day, right? So when Frank gives you an unrelenting standard, argue with him but guess what frank doesn't care frank frank uh an aspect of frank can be uh is kind of like a bully he's a nuisance he's irritating and he doesn't care as a matter of fact sometimes frank enjoys you arguing with him think about arguing with a drunk person how do you reckon you'll go? You reckon you're going to convince a drunk person of something, you know? You know, hey, Frank, look, mate, you've had too much to drink. It's time to go home, All right? What's Frank going to say? Okay, no, I don't know. You know, I've got plenty more in me. I'm fine. Don't worry. It's all good. You're probably not going to have too much luck. <laughs> yeah, look, look, mate, you're, you're completely drunk. Yeah. Or, no, no, no. I've only had a couple, All right? Yeah. This yeah. is what police try and do. They try and reason with someone. And when they meet Frank, who's not going to reason, they put their gloves on, they grab their uh, handcuffs, and they handcuff them. They put them in a room called a cell, or you know, at the watch house overnight, until Frank, who's completely drunk, sobers up a little bit, and they go, "Oh, here's this nice, lovely person who drank too much," and then we release them out. And we say, "Listen, buddy, don't do it again." You know, <laughs> yeah. um, and you're going to have to find your way home, right? And how embarrassing is that? Yeah. So <clears throat> when, when we look at it that way, you can argue with Frank. But F- Frank in some situations, and I'm not suggesting all situations, but Frank in some situations is completely uh, uh, oblivious and will not change his mind. So if I think about flying you know, in aeroplanes, I have, and trust me, I have argued with Frank, you know, till the cows come home. As a matter of fact, so much of me knows that the plane is not going to fall out of the sky. Why would I jump in an aeroplane if I actually thought it would? So I know rationally uh, it's not going to fall out of the sky. But every time I jump into an aeroplane, the moment there's even the slightest amount of turbulence, right or, or any, any any vibration and clearly there's going to be plenty of vibrations in a flying airplane that goes 600 kilometers an hour frank pipes up and goes oh my god okay? there are stress fact fractures in those in those wings now one of the wings is going to fall off i can see the wing is moving too much it's going to tear off it shouldn't flex that much 
and I can reason with it and I like engineering. So I can go out and say, no, 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 it's flexing normally. Frank's going, I don't know. It looks a bit too far from me. And what happens if it's at its maximum flex and then you hit, you know, turbulence? It'll flex more than its maximum and that's when it's going to break. You know? This is the stuff that goes on and on and on. Now, guess what? Sometimes Frank's not going to be there as much in a flight and I don't know why. I mean, I've been even been able to fall asleep on a flight. But I tell you what, a recent flight that I had actually from, from, from Melbourne back to Canberra from watching the Australian Open, <coughs> yeah, the turbulence was wild. You know, we're going through the bushfire clouds. Mm, yeah. And, oh, I tell you what, you know, Frank was, you know, uh, not only, you know, yelling, screaming loud, he was the, both passengers on both sides of me. He was the passengers in front of me and he was the passengers behind me. He was yelling at the top of his lungs about how terrible it was. I was petrified. My heart was racing like mad and so on and so forth. You can reason and try and argue and so on, but the question is, will Frank? Now, sometimes Frank is more reasonable. So from an act perspective, I would actually argue, let's try and reason with Frank first. But when he's not responsive to that, let's recognize that he's drunk, right? And I know that in certain places, certain contexts, for example, flying, being in an airplane, germs, um, whether I've achieved enough, enough at work. I know in those contexts, because I've lived in my skin for long enough, he is going to be unrelenting irrespective of what I say. So I don't argue with him anymore in those spaces because I know I won't get anywhere or I'm certainly not confident. So I'll just say, thanks, Frank. Cheers, mate. And, and get on with how I want to live my life. So I suppose is that the, the kind of next part to the formula once we've kind of been able to identify that Frank exists, we don't necessarily have to argue with him. He can kind of just chill there and say what he wants and, and do what he wants and and we don't have to believe everything that he's telling us. Um, I suppose what's what's the next stage? Is there a next stage or is it enough to kind of identify that he's there and we don't have to listen to him? In some sense, Frank's even asking that question that you've just asked. It's kind of like, well, then what's next? You know, what's the well, solution for Frank, right? I don't know if there is a solution. I, I, I certainly don't see anything in psychology that is observable that the research shows of what can we do with Frank other than you know, argue with him or learn to live with him. Yeah? Uh, I, I, in some sense, like to have in, uh, a relationship with Frank, and that's kind of what we're talking about here, a relationship where I give him space and room to be in my life rather than try and get rid of him. The more I try and get rid of him, I'm in, I'm in conflict. I'm pushing against him. I'm trying to get rid of him. And he loves that sort of stuff, right? He loves to dispute and argue. Um, yeah, that, that, that's really enjoyable for him. But also a relationship where I appreciate that Frank does a lot of wonderful things too. So he's not the bad guy. Frank's also the guy that gives me lots of reminders. He can give me encouragement in other contexts. He can go out and uh, also give me really high standards that I can achieve, that I can control, that I can take charge over and empower and empowering uh, ideas, comments and beliefs as well. So, you know, Frank ain't the bad guy that I've sort of painted in the first part of, you know, chatting. He's also someone who goes out and, and believes in me and encourages me. Just sometimes depending on how I'm going uh, or you know, how life is or however it all unfolds, he might be louder in an unhelpful manner. Sometimes he's quite loud in a quite helpful manner. But that that's a slippery slope, right? I, I don't want to necessarily be very, uh, how can I phrase this, um, accommodating for Frank in either direction because if I believe him openly when he's giving me encouragement, I build trust that he's going to give me, you know, useful ideas, thoughts, feelings. And so I, I almost in some sense become uh, 
if I can use the word, dependent on certain commentary to you know feel confident or feel empowered yeah. versus saying it's nice when he's empowering, you know, saying empowering things, uh, but it's okay when he's not. I still have a decision. So a bit of a love, uh, love-hate relationship with, 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 with Frank. I actually like to use lots of humour. And that's why I like the idea of giving, you know, Frank a name because it's certainly not me. And, and that's what's one of the major problems. We, we attribute that voice as being it's me, you know, I was thinking this, I was thinking that, you know, I always self-sabotage. No, 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 no. We all have a stream of thoughts. That's just how it is. We wouldn't go out and say the clouds sabotage the weekend because it rained. No, no, no. The clouds just rain. That's what they do. There's that, that, that's its function, right? Well, Frank has his function as well right? and is a stream of thoughts and you and I can consciously decide on how we relate to Frank. So act in some sense, you know, except for the therapy in some sense is really a way of developing a brand new relationship or a more helpful, useful relationship with being in our own skin. You know, so that me and Frank can live, uh, coexist, uh, and in actual fact, I can utilise all the lovely things that Frank offers. Um, there's heaps of those, uh, but when he sends me some doozy ideas, you know, some some you know uh, BS, so to speak, you know, unhelpfulness, uh, things that are certainly not beneficial, I can just go out and say, ah, oh, you know, Frank can um, you know talk a bit of crap sometimes. So, you know, thanks, mate. Cheers, mate. But um. I'm not going to follow that, you know. And this is what mum and dad used to say back in the day for most of us, you know. If your friends walked off a cliff, would you follow yeah. Right? Well, if Frank told you to do something, would you do it? Right? Yeah. You know. And that's the, the truth is that the most influential people in our, a person in our life is Frank. Mm-hmm. Not mum, not dad, not our friends. Frank. So we've got to work on this relationship and, and, and you know, it, this is what I think ACT fundamentally is, is, is trying to understand a flexible relationship with Frank. In, in some sense, maybe even, and, you know, maybe this is stepping too far, but I, I think, you know, a loving relationship, you know, because I love Frank for lots of the things that he does. Um, uh, but you know what? It's a pain in the ass, kind of like loved ones. You know, family members can also be quite hard as well. But, mm-hmm. you know, we love them. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to get rid of Frank because I have to therefore get rid of all the good things. Um, and we try and get rid of Frank as well. I mean, you know, people go and they have a real hard day with perfectionism, you know, trying to meet all of Frank's ideals and so on and so forth. And they get home and they drink. They drink to shut Frank up or, or Frank even says, you know what, the only way you can relax is to drink. Mm, or, or, to, <clears throat> or to work really hard, um, to work, to work really you know, 12, 15 hours a day and then that's the only way we shut him up because he goes, okay, you know. Yeah. And then if I've had a few drinks of a night, Frank goes out and says, well, guess what, if people find out I'm, you know, uh, a, a drinker at night, I'm functioning, but I'm a drinker. They will go out and not like me, and so I better keep this under wraps and God knows what else I, I do, you know, that I'm embarrassed about and so on. And because these are all unrelenting standards. I, I can't be the perfect everything, you know, the perfect son, the perfect, you know, husband, the perfect brother, the perfect psychologist, the perfect boss, the perfect manager, the perfect whatever. So, you know, we have to have a good relationship with Frank. Mm-hmm. Or, or you know, if you want, you can keep arguing with him. You can just keep <laughs> fighting and arguing and wrestling, and um, you can do that too. You know, Acts doesn't say you're not allowed to do that. You fill your boots, see how you go. But um, you know, uh, psychology Act appreciates that whatever you do, it, it, it it's um, it's not going to go out and shut Frank up because it's kind of like saying, "How can I stop being human?" Mm-hmm. So, yeah, fantastic. And I really like the analogies that you used. Um, so just, I guess, to, to summarise um, in the context of perfectionism and unrelenting standards, 
uh, we might experience these thoughts around having to achieve this impossibly perfect standard. Um, we don't necessarily have to give into those thoughts. We can, you know, say thank you to, to Frank, who is telling us these things, and um, accept that they're there. We can argue with him if we want to. Uh, we can try to please him if we want to, but it probably won't serve us in the long term. So it's it's kind of enough to, to acknowledge that he's there, but to also acknowledge that we don't have to believe everything that he says. Couldn't say it better myself. Beautiful summary. And 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 that's what it is, this, you know, who are we pleasing? You know? Perfectionism or Frank, you know, the, 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 these ideals, or am I going to please myself, you know, and, and move back in line with who and what's important to me? You know, that, that, that fundamental question, the, you know, the values part of, of you know, the act model, you know, who and what's important. Isn't that what, what it's all about? Isn't that what, what, what life's about? You know, it's not about perfectionism. It's about who and what's important. Mm-hmm. And I guess giving some space um, between yourself and Frank to actually figure that out. Yeah. and acknowledge it absolutely yeah. absolutely so awesome. yeah that's that's um probably enough on that and we might, might be able so. to wrap it up there you know and, and uh, <laughs> we can all say thanks frank for uh you know whatever you've been saying in the background during <laughs> thanks this. frank for his um yeah contribution to, to this podcast much appreciated <laughs> uh, awesome thanks consent. so much we didn't get his consent but no um, we didn't did we Sorry, Frank. (laughs) Uh, Awesome, Nish. Thanks so much for that chat. I really enjoyed this one and um, I'll catch you in the next one. Thanks, Mary. Likewise. Bye. If you enjoyed this podcast, please support it by going to iTunes and putting a review. Subscribe, share it via social media and tell others about it. Start a conversation. It's listeners like you that make this podcast able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources and just lastly if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team develop your experience and get into some exciting work come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out i'd love to hear from you